Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to speak about blue carbon habitats and their response to climate change in closed estuaries. Our research group focus area is blue carbon ecosystems and responses to climate change. And this typically looks at salt marshes, mangroves and sea grasses. We are also interested in the conservation and management of estuaries and that includes assessing the environmental flow requirements of estuaries, looking at ecological health and importance indices. We also investigate water quality, eutrophication and harmful algal blooms, as this is a growing pressure in our developing country. So we have 290 estuaries in total along our 3000 kilometer coastline in South Africa. It's a wave dominated coast. The estuaries are microtidal, they're small, they're shallow and significantly more than 75% of them close to the sea. We have a classification system for our different estuaries types and the ones I'm addressing today are the large temporary closed and the small temporary closed estuaries. Things such as estuarine lakes can also close to the sea and then we have six arid predominantly closed estuaries but these stay closed for up to years at a time. The ecological importance of temporary closed estuaries is that during the closed phase, they can have high microphytobenthos biomass. They can have very large submerged macrophyte beds. Both the macrobenthos and salt marsh in these systems tend to be a subset of the permanently open estuaries. They serve as fish nursery habitats, and they can also serve as bird roosting feeding uh, sites for feeding residents and migratory birds. So in the country, we have different biogeographic zones spreading from the cool temperate to the warm temperate to the subtropical. And that is along a rainfall gradient as well, less than 100 up on the west coast, moving down to around 800 on the south coast and up to over 1,200 millimeters per annum on the east coast. Because of this rainfall gradient, the closed estuaries have different times of the year when the mouth is open to the sea. So we have seasonal winter opening on the west coast, unpredictable opening on the south coast, and seasonal summer opening on the east coast. With climate change, the west coast is going to get drier and we expect more closed mouth conditions, whereas the east coast is going to get wetter and we expect more open mouth conditions. Our research, and particularly mine, which focuses on the primary producers, has looked at a number of aspects in closed estuaries, such as nutrient cycling, seed banks, and the response of the plants to open and closed events, the influence of mouth state and water level, the phenology of plants, um, uh, dam releases, and what happens in some of the estuaries. And we've also done a number of multidisciplinary studies involving all disciplines to understand the different phases of mouth opening, mouth closure, and what this means. And in our country, we're quite lucky because we have some pristine estuaries, not only those in a degraded state, so those that function naturally in terms of their opening and closing events. So in the East Clanamunda estuaries, one such pristine system, we found here that the macrophytes are extremely adapted to variable conditions, particularly variable water level. So that when the mouth is open, shown in this picture, and the water level is low, you'll have rapid germination of the dominant salt marsh, Sarcocornia perennis, a succulent, from a very large seed bank. As soon as the mouth closes and the estuary fills up with water, in this photo on the right, you have rapid growth of submerged macrophytes, such as Rupia serosa. And so an understanding of these dynamic responses allows us to inform mouth management plans in the country, these are needed if artificial breaching takes place. And from our knowledge of the life cycles of the plants, we can say when it's best for the mouth to be open to the sea, and that's usually spring and summer because that is where the plants are flowering, um, setting seed. This picture shows sarcocornea, and uh, under closed mouth conditions, one of the responses that happens is an extension growth. So the plants will grow so that the biomass is above the water. And here, once the biomass was above the water, the plants flowered and set seed. So flooding and mouth closure also is strongly linked to salt marsh phenology and the life cycles of the dominant species. It's not only salt marsh that responds to closed mouth conditions. 
In this case study, because of droughts and freshwater abstraction, the mouth of the estuary closed to the sea and the dominant mangrove species, Abyssinia marina, died back. A water level rose above the pneumatophores, the air roots. The plants died rapidly within a three month period. And we monitored responses over a few years. The mangroves were replaced by salt marsh. This is the habitat showing the dead mangrove trees and salt marsh four years later. Climate change also includes temperature and across our biogeographic zones, we're expecting an expansion of cool temperate taxa due to upwelling and an expansion of subtropical taxa due to warming in temperatures. And this is actually resulting in a squeeze on the warm temperate taxa. For the primary producers, what we have is a mangrove growing into salt marsh habitats. And the one example where we have this is actually a site where the mangroves were planted and they've rapidly expanded into the salt marsh area at the Nahoon estuary. Freshwater flooding is expected to increase with climate change, so rainfall will come in more intense events. And we have data to show how in some estuaries which have get colonized by mangroves, it's only very small areas and they're rapidly washed out by floods. So floods will come and reset that estuary. With the increase in flooding, we expect to increase in these dynamic responses. Open mouth conditions for estuaries are of course good because they maintain adequate water quality. So fresh water inflow, make sure that the system is flushed Together with the open mouth condition, you have oxygenated system, the salinity grading, their scouring and resuspension. But what happens when there are nutrient inputs and the mouth is closed, there's rapid eutrophication and the response can be an increase in macroalgae, filamentous green algae, an increase in some of the harmful algal bloom species, such as the microalgae heterosigma, uh, an increase in invasive aquatic macrophytes, such as water hyacinths as shown here, and overall, when this high biomass decomposes, then there's low oxygen and fish kills. And they're fish kills that now occur in 10% of South Africa's estuaries. The macroalgal blooms in this picture shows one of our long-term monitoring transect sites, low water level, the salt marsh is flourishing, high water level, the macroalgae grow. And this is when the water level drops again, that high macroalgal biomass, it covers the salt marsh resulting in dieback. So this shows the effect of dead macroalgae that caused a dieback and a change in cover of the dominant salt marsh plant, Sarcocornia decumbens. Sea storms will also increase with climate change. And this was in the Kleinamunde estuary. Here's water level. Uh, a sea storm came. It filled the estuary up so that the mouth opened and there was a decrease in water. But with the mouth closed again, but with overwash and topping, the water level increased. Um, it, the, that event resulted in a 10 parts increase in salinity. And this resulted in a complete shift of the dominant primary producers from submerged macrophytes, from rupia that were dominant, to macroalgae under the more saline conditions. And this was even a change in species composition of those macroalgae that were present. So a change from the filaments, filamentous green species to the more saline species. With climate change will also come an increase in storm events. So marine overwash when the mouth is closed with a higher water level, we expect more overwash to occur. Storm surge events, it's known that a two degrees Celsius increase will result in a 10% increase in wind speeds. And with a 10% increase in wind speeds, that's a 25% increase in wave height. Increased wave height results in sediment deposition and we've got one example to show where sediment deposition coming from the sea, marine sediment deposited on the mangrove areas, once again covered up the pneumatophores of the dominant Abyssinia marina and led to dieback of a fairly large area of mangrove. So if we summarize our understanding with climate change and closed estuaries, um, under increased drought, and this will particularly happen on our west coast, we expect an increase in salinity and closed mouth conditions. That will result in more habitat for submerged macrophytes, but will um, flood, inundate, and result in dieback of salt marsh vegetation. Increased floods will lead to increased scouring, and increased floods means increased runoff from the land, so an increase in eutrophication. 
which um, in this case is macroalgae, which will um, outcompete other macrophytes in the system. Sea level rise and increased storminess could result in an increase in open mouth conditions. So if you have an increase in sea level rise, that might open the mouth and allow for increase in tidal exchange and then an increase in salt marsh and mangroves is expected due to this new available habitat. But it can also cause marine sediment deposition, mouth closure and inundation, which would then cause a dieback of salt marsh and mangroves. So we can see that there's a lot of different operating factors. Increased temperature and CO2 will increase plant growth and productivity, and already we're seeing some indication along our coast of mangroves replacing salt marsh. So we're trying to understand these abiotic changes, how they affect the ecological processes and attributes, and then linking it to ecosystem services. So climate change really acts as a catalyst for sustainable management, and all of our estuaries, we consider them as socio-ecological systems, where we can relate estuary health to ecosystem service provision, to human health and the state of the societal system. To improve both estuary state and the societal state, we need restoration, but that must be done in a strategic adaptive management cycle closely linked to how we're improving health, ecosystem services, and human well being. Currently, I'm working on three topics, and I'm looking for um, some co-authors on these manuscripts that are in drafts. So I'm working on water release from dams to maintain downstream estuary and ecosystem health. What examples and good practice have we got around on that globally? I'm looking at ecological principles for the artificial breaching of estuaries that close to the sea. So when is artificial breaching done to actually improve the ecological health of an estuary? And what can we learn from that? And then lastly, mangroves in closed estuaries and their future fate. Do closed estuaries actually represent a future available habitat for colonization of mangroves? And so closed estuaries and climate change gives us a lot of opportunities for new research and collaboration. I thank the organizers for the invites to this conference, to my funders, the Water Research Commission and the NRF. And please find um, some more information on our YouTube site. And we also have a Facebook site and a Twitter account. Thank you very much.